Charles from GMAT Ninja here. Welcome to episode number 19 in our comprehensive GMAT and executive assessment quant series. Today we're talking about combinations and permutations, and you might be wondering why are we doing this topic so late in the series? Here's the deal. Only about 2% of your questions on the GMAT or the EA are going to come from combinations and permutations. Very, very, very minor topic. So my goal here today, as much as anything, is to get you through the very, very basics. So if your goal is something, let's say, 47 or below on the GMAT quant or virtually anything on the EA quant, um, we're going to be through the very, very basics. When does order matter? When does order not matter? When are formulas useful? When should you rely on intuition? Now, for those of you who are going for something a whole lot more ambitious, we're going to have some fun with this. Combinations and permutations are one of those topics where there's not a whole lot of components to it as far as technical stuff. A few basic concepts and you're in good shape on the fundamentals. For the vast majority of you watching this, that's going to be enough for you. If you want to enjoy doing some hard questions, that's where we just kind of start throwing in random wrinkles. And those wrinkles are pretty much infinite. They're rare on the GMAT, even rarer on the EA. But we can throw plenty of those at you. We're going to have some fun with that last uh, third to half of the video, giving you some of the hardest questions we can come up with that are still realistic. Um, who needs this video? Well, if you're somebody who doesn't want to overstudy and you just want to kind of do the bare minimum that you need to get to your score goal, you're absolutely in the right place. First three questions I'm going to cover today are going to be the, the, the kind of the nuts and bolts of the topic, things you really, really need to master to be able to get to a, a strong score in the 40s, low to mid 40s. Um, now, if combinations and permutations keep you up at night, you've seen them on tests, you've seen it on practice tests, seen them in the official guides, and they just bug you. Couple different things we can help you with there. One is obviously solidifying your foundations, but just as importantly, I'm going to be really explicit about where to draw that line between what you really need and what's kind of gratuitous and extra if you're going for a super, super high score. So again, if your goal is a 47 or under on quant, it's really just the first three questions or so that are going to be relevant. I'll draw a pretty clear line when I'm kind of done with that stuff and get into the things that are a little bit more exotic, unusual, difficult. Now, if you don't know which formula to use, a very, very common problem people run into. If you're fairly new to this topic, or even if you've been studying it for a while and you still find that you miss questions, often the problem is that you're applying the wrong formula in the wrong situation. I'm going to take a pretty non-technical approach to it today and kind of try to get your intuition really, really strong around combinations and permutations. Minimize the number of formulas you need to memorize and use. Try to make sure that you understand when to use which tool. And again, if you're going for a super, super high score, 50, 51 on the GMAT quant, we're going to have some fun towards the end. It's going to be problems that are kind of random challenge problems. So you'll get a good workout out of this, if nothing else, if you're going for a super high score. Again, for a lot of the rest of you, maybe you stop halfway through the video, and that's fantastic. All right, with that, I'm going to warm you up super, super gently. First question or two is going to be really, really easy. Bear with me. I'm going to kind of explain the things you really need to understand in order to be resilient on the test and make sure that you don't make mistakes on kind of the foundational ones. And here comes our first one. All right, if you need another minute, feel free to hit the pause button. Okay, pretty simple, about as straightforward as a permutation question gets. And by the way, don't worry about the jargon. Permutation is when order matters. Combination is when it doesn't matter. I don't care if you know those terms at all. Some people really like to reference them. It helps them kind of keep track of what's going on. If it doesn't help you, purge them from your brain as long as you can track what's going on. I'm happy. So we've got 10 destinations on Balzania Airlines. Some guy named Ralph is going to randomly choose four. 
And then this next sentence that I wrote up here in green is the most important thing. He will visit the locations in the order in which they are chosen. And we want to know how many different itineraries he can create. Single most important thing on combination permutation questions is just make sure you're really clear about does order matter or does it not matter? And the GMAT is not out to trick you on this. This is one of the things that test prep companies unfortunately sometimes do wrong in their practice questions is sometimes you really have to think hard about, well, what's the intent of the author here? Do they mean to make this a situation where order matters or where it doesn't? In this case, on an official GMAT question, this is not official, but this particular sentence is ripped off from an official question. The rest of it's not. This is the kind of language they use. They're going to be really, really explicit in saying, hey, order matters. They're going to make it as clear as they possibly can. They're not trying to get you on that. Just make sure that you're thinking about it consciously. Now, in this case, super simple question. Order does matter. So what we're basically saying is, hey, we've got, I'll call them A, B, C, and B, and he's going to visit them in that order. And how many options does he have for destination A? Well, obviously there's 10. He's not going to visit the same destination twice. So nine options for the second stop, third stop, eight, fourth stop, seven. All we have to do is multiply these together the way the answer choices are written. I don't even have to do the arithmetic. Clearly it's going to be E. There's nothing else that's even in the right ballpark. So our answer here is E. Fantastic. Now, real quick, just to make sure that we're connecting the dots here. Notice I don't use a formula here. So when order matters, I have no need for a formula. It's when order doesn't matter that I'm going to go ahead and use a formula. So if I rephrase this question and we get rid of this thing, and now instead of saying how many different itineraries, what if I just say how many different, I don't know, combinations of destinations, or that's kind of a strange phrase here, but could Ralph, how about select? Well, now what we're saying is the order doesn't matter. We're being pretty explicit about it and saying combinations of itineraries could Ralph select. Often on the GMAT, they'll even tell you in parentheses, order doesn't matter here. They'll give you some really, really sharp indication of it. So this is where we'd use the formula. So instead of using slots and saying there's 10 options for the first destination and then nine for the second and then seven, instead we'll use this handy little guy. And if you're totally new to this, N is the number of items in your main group. So 10 in this case, K is the number of items in your subgroup. And really all we have to do is start plugging stuff in here and we're in business. 10 factorial over six factorial, four factorial. So 10 times nine times eight times seven over four times three times two. And again, if you're totally new to this, what I'm doing here is I'm crossing out everything from six downward off the numerator. Do a little bit more canceling here. The eight, the four and the two can go. I can reduce that to a three and we get 210. Now notice here, it's one of the, the incorrect answers is 210 because the way the original question was phrased, order matters. This is what you would do if order doesn't matter. Now notice, order doesn't matter, use a formula. Order matters, just use slots, no formula needed. I don't want you to use a formula here just because they're really easy to confuse. They look really similar. So if you've learned a formula for permutations and it's working for you, fantastic. If you tend to mix them up, delete this formula from your head. Just use this when order does not matter. If order matters, use your slots. That's it. Honestly, for a lot of you, if your goal is something like the mid 40s on the GMAT, you can almost stop right here. I'm going to go through two more fairly foundational questions just to kind of drill in this principle and take it a step or two further. But if you can master this, you're insulated against errors on most of what you're going to see for kind of medium to, or I'd, I'd say kind of medium level, easy to medium level combination permutation questions. This is the fundamental concept. And don't worry, the video is going to get a whole lot harder. But if your goals are modest, this is really the heart of it. You don't need a whole lot more. All right, one more. Again, super straightforward for this next one as well.
As always, if you need a little bit more time, feel free to hit the pause button. Okay. Pretty much a warm-up level question here as well. The only thing we've done differently is now instead of 10 destinations and we're visiting them in order, now we've made it six domestic, four international, and we're going to choose two domestic and two international. And notice from the language, order clearly doesn't matter here. It says combinations, nothing about visiting them in the order that they are chosen, just visiting them in whatever order. So all we're doing is we're saying, all right, we got the six domestic destinations, and we're going to choose two of those. And then we've got the four international destinations. And we're going to choose two of those as well. Okay, very straightforward application of the combination formula we were just going through a minute ago. So n factorial over n minus k factorial times k factorial. So it's six, oops, six times five divided by two times one. So that's 15. Same idea here. We get 4 factorial over 2 factorial times 2 factorial, which gives me 4 times 3. I'll go ahead and write it all out this time because it's pretty straightforward. Over 2 times 2, the 2s can go, and I just get 6. Okay, last little bit. All you have to do is multiply these guys together. For every set of two domestic destinations, there are six sets of two international destinations. So 15 times 6, and we get 90. All right, one last fairly fundamental question, then we'll ramp these up a little bit. As always, hit the pause button if you need it. Okay, so we've got six salads, four desserts. Question is how many different combinations? And there's that word again. GMATs never have to trick you with order matters. Order doesn't matter. It's your job to pay attention. Here, we're clearly saying order doesn't matter. We're going to choose four items out of those 10. And we want to know how many of those sets of four include at least one dessert. And if you've watched any of our probability videos, that should ring some bells. We'll come back to that in a moment. Let's start with kind of that initial set. So we've got We've got 10 different things to choose from. And I'm going to start by figuring out how many total combinations of four items I can pick. So total combinations of four, 10 items I'm going to choose four from them. So just like in the last question, and I'll run through the arithmetic pretty quickly here, canceling everything that's six and below off the numerator, times four times three times two, going to cancel the four and the two with the eight three and the nine, and I've got 210. So at the very, very least right now, if you're totally lost on what to do with that, at least one thing, well, your answer has got to be, it's probably not D because there's going to be some items that don't qualify here, but uh, you know that your answer has can't be E. That's way too big. All right. Now, what do we do with this at least one dessert thing? Now, of these, notice that there are two different kinds of combinations you can have. You can have combinations with no dessert, and you can have combos with at least one dessert.
And the question is, which of these is going to be easier to, to calculate directly? I'm going to vote for that top one. Combinations with no dessert. That's not that hard to get. All I have to do is pretend that there are no desserts here. And I can figure out exactly how many different combinations there are that consist of just four salads. So combinations of four salads chosen from a group of six. Now we're right back to that straightforward just combination formula. So combinations with no dessert. Six salads. I'm going to choose four of those salads. No dessert. Sad story. So six factorial times four or over four factorial times two factorial. So six times five divided by two, we get 15. So what do we know? We've got 210 total combinations of four items from this menu. Of those combinations of four items, I know that 15 different combinations exist that are salad only. That doesn't sound like fun. So 210 minus 15, and that's going to give me the ones that have at least one dessert in them. So 210 minus 15, that's going to be 195. And my answer is C. Okay. Nine questions total in this video, three questions down. Next three, we're going to do three things that are uh, we're starting to get out there in terms of kind of the, the rarity of them, a little bit more exotic, still based in some intuition. If you're going for a super high score, these are going to be good for you. Um, if you're going for something more modest, let's say mid 40s or below on the GMAT, or um, let's say a 15 or under on the um, executive assessment, don't lose too much sleep over these. If you want to stick with us, you might enjoy these. And again, if you're shooting for a super high score, you can see these next few as foundational as well. Good luck to you on this next one. All right. If you're struggling a little bit, feel free to hit the pause button. Keep working on it. And if you're really struggling, this a little bit over your head. And again, if your school goals, goals are modest, don't lose sleep over this. This is a pretty rare variant, as is pretty much everything we're going to cover in the rest of the video. Remember, combinations, permutations, 2% of your test. So don't lose too much sleep over this if it's giving you trouble. Now, what this question really is, is it's just taking kind of that fundamental combinations formula, turning it inside out a little bit, and just kind of changing what you're looking for. Notice once again, that word combinations in the middle of the question, GMAT's never going to try to get you on making that language slippery, making you wonder if it's order matters or it doesn't matter. Very clearly does not matter here. So we've got some restaurant menu. The menu has three different tacos. We don't know how many burritos. That's what we're going after. We know that if we're going to pick two different tacos from those three, we're going to pick three different burritos from those who knows how many on the menu. And we're going to get a total of 105 different combinations of two tacos, three burritos. Okay, so step one here, I just want to organize my information a little bit because this, this feels a little bit unnatural compared to the normal combinations questions you see. So tacos, we got three on the menu. I'm going to choose two. So I'm choosing two out of the three. Sounds exactly like something we can punch into our formula really, really easily. Three factorial over two factorial, one factorial. So we get three different combinations of two tacos. Now we know that total, we're going to get 105 combinations of two tacos and three burritos. So that tells me right off the bat, I must have 35 combinations of three burritos. And the question is, 
you're choosing three out of X. And what is that X? How many different burritos are on the menu? Now, a couple of different ways you can go here. I'm going to show two different methods from here. One is a little bit more technical. If it hurts your brain, no worries at all. I'll show you kind of a more intuitive way afterwards. One isn't necessarily better than the other. One of them might be much, much better for you than the other. And if so, that's fantastic. Which one, whichever one of these resonates more, run with it. That's fantastic. Different strokes for different folks. Again, that's a feature, not a bug of the GMAT. So I've got those 35 combinations. Now I could just kind of set this up algebraically and say, all right, choosing three out of X. So I can say X factorial over three factorial times X minus three, whole thing factorial. And again, if your head's spinning right now, don't lose sleep over it. I can multiply out that three factorial. Again, I'm going to show you a different way in a minute. It's a little bit, little bit less technical, a little bit less algebraic. Three factorial is six. I can multiply that across. So then what I'm left with is X factorial over X minus three factorial is equal to 210. Now, this is where it gets really, really tough to see unless you're pretty experienced with this stuff or really, really confident with algebra and factorials. So X factorial over X minus three factorial. What I'm going to have here is X, X minus one and X minus two. Everything from X minus three and under is just going to cancel out. So X times X minus one times X minus two is equal to 210. Now from here, if you wanted to try to solve this as a cubic equation and multiply this out and do some funky stuff, knock yourself out, much, much easier is to recognize these are three consecutive integers. And I just have to think through what three consecutive integers. So it's going to be one of these things will be X. What three consecutive integers are going to multiply out to 210? And from here, I could I could take these one at a time and punch them in and go that way. I could also recognize that there has to be a five in here. And again, I'm getting into some kind of number property stuff. I see that zero. It's got to be five times something. So my bet here, first place I'm going to start, because if I if X is eight, I've got eight, seven, six. I know that's not going to work because there's no way that's going to multiply to 210. What about seven times six times five? Perfect. That's going to do it for me. My answer is D. Now, if you didn't follow all of this, if kind of what I did there with the canceling of the factorials made your head spin, if I lost you a little bit and kind of thinking about this conceptually, no worries at all. You can do just kind of conventional back solving here. And I'm not a huge fan of back solving as a method on the GMAT. It's one of those things that test prep companies, certainly the some of the older ones, tend to kind of portray it as this magical method. Oh, you can back solve. It's going to save your, your bacon on the GMAT. No, it's not. Very, very rare that it, it does a lot for you. But here, sure, because I could just say, well, let me just start punching numbers in here for X and see what happens. And you can start anywhere you'd like. Um, I, again, I can start from the biggest number, work my way down and say, well, okay, choosing three out of eight, is that going to get me 35? Eight factorial over five factorial, three factorial. And I want to know, is this thing equal to 35? So cancel out again, eight times seven times six over three times two, is that equal to 35? And the answer here is no, that's going to cancel out. I get 56. And as my high school math teacher liked to say, 56 elephants does not equal 35 elephants. So it's not E. What about the next one? Choosing three out of seven, seven factorial over three factorial, four factorial, seven times six times five over three times two. And there we go. I got it. That is equal to 35. And once again, we get D either way. So again, if you're going for a super, super, super high score, you want your 50, 51 quant. Yeah, I suppose I, I can kind of expect you to sort of do it the slightly more algebraic way. It's more efficient, more likely to be reliably efficient. For the rest of you, if you can kind of clobber your way through back solving here, I'm happy as a clam. That's great. These questions are so rare and we're getting into some fairly difficult stuff. So if you got at it by back solving and it took you a little bit of extra time, no shame in that at all. That's a perfectly valid solution here. As long as you could follow that initial logic of kind of what's going on with multiplying those different combinations together, you're in really good shape. All right, we're going to keep ramping these up a little bit. Good and take a couple minutes.
All right, as always, hit the pause button if you need another minute or two to grapple with this guy. So we've got six letters, O, I, N, 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 and K, and we're going to rearrange them to make six-letter strings, and we want to know how many of those distinct six-letter strings are possible. Notice, again, there's always going to be something really, really obvious in a GMAT or EA question. Rearranged indicates that we're talking about a situation where order does matter. You change the arrangement of those letters, you get a different six-letter string, you get a different code would be another way to frame this. So we know that we're talking about just using slots here. You could use a formula. I'm going to stay away from it in this video. Again, if the formula works for you, knock yourself out. What we found over 20 plus years of tutoring is that people tend to mix up the formulas. So order does matter here. No need for a formula. You can just kind of draw it out in slots, think through the logic. And again, as we get to these harder questions, we're going to start to rely more and more on intuition. It's less about kind of understanding some basic process and a little bit more about kind of figuring out how you can fit things together and think about what's the little quirk in the question that's going to make it a little bit different from what's really obvious. Now, the obvious thing to do here, six letters, well, I got six options for this, the first spot. I got five options for the second. The way this is written, very clear that we can't repeat, right? So we're going to rearrange just these six letters. We've got four options for the next spot and so on. So... You might just say, well, hey, multiply those together. We get six factorial. That's 720. My answer is E. Hold on. Think about these ends. So how many ways are there to rearrange three ends? Just one, right? It's going to look the same no matter what. Now imagine for a second that you were assuming that they were distinct, which is what we did right here. So just punching in six factorial, punching these into the slots, we're implicitly assuming that these six letters are truly distinct. It's kind of like we're assuming that it's N1, N2, and N3, which it's not, right? They all look the same. Now, if they were three distinct letters, how many different ways could we rearrange them? Well, three different things. We can rearrange them. This is going to be another version of the permutation, right? Let's multiply those together. There's six different ways to rearrange three distinct letters. So here's my point. As we get into some of these harder ones, the question is, how are we overcounting if we do the obvious thing? So if we just do the obvious thing and get our six factorial, 720, where does the overcounting come in? It comes in because we're pretending that these ends are distinct when they're not. They all look the same. Now, by what factor are we overcounting? If we do this, we're pretending that those are different letters. Now, those three ends can be in, if they're different, we can rearrange them six times. So we must be overcounting by a factor of six. So all we need to do here on a question like this, where you have some sort of repeated digit or repeated letter or repeated color or something like that, is to say, all right, so the six factorial here, that's my total number of ways to do it if I'm not correcting for that redundancy among these. And then divide by the number of ways to rearrange those common items. So those three ends that are identical, I can rearrange those three factorial ways. So that's my overcounting factor. All I have to do is divide by that. And I'm just going to get 5 times 4 times 3 times 2, just canceling out the 6 there. And instead of 720, I'm going to get 120. And that's all there is to it. Sometimes you have people call this the Mississippi rule. And there's formulas rolling around for this. I don't need you to memorize the formula or anything like that. I just want you to be able to think through, okay, where's the redundancy? What's that factor that I need to correct by to account for the fact that I've got the same thing repeated? And that's all there is to it. This will appear again in another question or two, give you a slightly harder version of it with more wrinkles. All right. Here comes one more, ramping it up just a little bit more, hopefully.
As always, hit the, hit the pause button if you need it. Okay, so we've got each of five countries sending three people to a conference, and we're going to choose some three-person committees that don't include more than one representative from a single country. So that three-person committee has to be comprised of three people from three different countries. All right. If you've seen this kind of thing before, maybe this is super, super easy for you once you've seen it once or twice. That's great. These are pretty darn rare on the GMAT. And again, as much as anything, I just want to kind of show you like ways to start pushing your thought process on these and kind of go, okay, how can I see this tougher question a little bit inside out or look at it from a different angle and try to get at it? A uh, bunch of different ways to solve it. What I find to be the most intuitive here is to say, okay, imagine that I'm the person selecting this committee and I'm going, okay, I've got 15 different people to choose from, but I'm not just choosing any three people. I'm going to choose people from five, from three of these five different countries. So my first step might be to say, okay, which three countries do I want represented? I'm going to draw a silly little picture here just because it, it sometimes helps me that if this is a country, there's three people from that country represented by random circles because I have the artistic aptitude of a drunk four-year-old. And here's my 15 people. And I'm going, okay, I'm going to choose three of these countries first or three of these delegations first out of five. Notice the language again. Committees could be chosen. Order doesn't matter. I'm going to choose three out of these five. Listen to that language in your head as you're saying it. Clearly, I'm going to write for that straightforward combinatorics formula, combinations formula. So I'm going to choose three of these five countries first. Choose three out of five, five factorial over three factorial, two factorial. I can reduce that to five times four over two. I've got 10 different ways to choose three countries here or three delegations. Okay. Now for each of those delegations, so let's say that I'm working with these three. How many different ways can I choose those people? For each of these 10 combinations of three countries, I can look at that first country and go, I got three different people I could choose. Same thing for the second delegation, same thing for the third. So I take that 10, I multiply it by three, multiply it by three again, by three one more time, 27 times 10, 270. And my answer is B. Again, we're getting towards the end of the video. If you're starting to struggle a little bit, no shame in that whatsoever. Again, this is not the thing that's going to hold you back from a 4748 on the GMAT, not going to hold you back from a 1213 on the EA, certainly not going to hold you back from a 700 plus, even a 750 if your verbal is really strong on the GMAT. So if you're starting to struggle on these guys, don't worry about it too much at all. Think of these as a really good workout if you're going for a good challenge. If you enjoy this, fantastic. And we're going to keep making it more difficult. Three more questions to go. Good luck to you. All right, if you're having fun, feel free to hit the pause button. Okay, now we're getting to stuff where we just start throwing random wrinkles in there. Can the GMAT do that to you? Yeah. 
going to see this exact set of wrinkles again? Almost certainly not. Again, these more advanced combinatorics questions are pretty rare. When you do see, I'm sure there's kind of an infinite variety of little things they can throw in there to make it a little bit, just a little bit more complicated or kind of take you away from your formulas and take you away from kind of rigid ways of thinking about it. As you get into these more challenging ones, these are 49, 50, 51 level questions on the GMAT. It's just a question of, can you kind of take these pieces, see something intuitive and figure out how to, how to start connecting the dots on the question. Obviously order doesn't matter. Once again, here, word rearranged appears. I'm going to start by saying how many total, I'm sorry, rearranged order does matter. I apologize. So total ways to rearrange these five letters. The temptation is to kind of say, well, four times five times three times two times one. But again, we've got that redundancy thing going on. We got two Ks, we got two O's, they look identical. We've got to correct for that. So it looks a lot like the question we did a few minutes ago. So we've got to take that five factorial. How many ways are there to arrange the two Ks? Well, just two, right? How many ways to arrange the O's? Two again. So I take the five factorial, I divide by two factorial, two factorial. So I just get five times three times two. So I get 30 total ways here. Now that is not my answer yet because I still have to deal with this business of the Ks not being adjacent. Lots of different ways to approach this. My preferred way is to say it's a lot easier for me to think about ways that they are adjacent. And I can kind of draw myself a picture to guide myself along here. So if you don't see kind of the shortcut right away, no problem at all. I Well, what happens if I get the KK over here and then I've got three more slots? I could have the KK here. I still have three more slots. And these are all gonna basically function the same way. And there's really only four different ways to place those two adjacent Ks. Well, okay, now for each of these, so each of these four spots I could stick the Ks into, how many different strings of five letters do I get? Well, the temptation here is to say, well, this is a three and this is a two, so I get six. Hold on, we've got those O's again. So we've got to correct for that redundancy, just like we did here. So if we've got the two Ks right in the beginning of the string, so we get three factorial, but those Os are redundant with each other. They look the same. So I've got to correct for that over two factorial. So I just get three ways. It's going to be the same if the Ks are placed here, same if the Ks are placed here, and same if the Ks are placed at the end. So four different spots I could stick the Ks in. For each of those spots I stick the Ks in, I've got three ways to rearrange the other three letters. So three times four, that gives me 12 different ways in which the Ks can be adjacent. 30 total ways, all I have to do is take the 30, subtract 12, I get 18, my answer is B. And I know I'm being really repetitive here. No shame at all in missing this, even if you are going for a super high score, this is tricky stuff, not because there's anything super special about it or super technical. It's just sometimes it's really hard to make that connection, especially in a two minute time frame. You're going to win a few and lose a few, even if you're really fantastic about this. And again, if you haven't struggled with any questions so far, awesome. Let me see if I can get you on these last two. Good luck to you.
All right. If you're not feeling confident yet, you want some more time, you are not alone. Feel free to hit the pause button for the rest of you. Let's hit it. Uh, full disclosure here. We tossed this around to four of my best tutors. These are all guys that have scored 51s on the GMAT uh, quant section. And we had some disagreement on this first round of, of going through this. It was a struggle for, for some of these guys too, just because it's so easy to forget some little piece of it or not think about one little thing or make some little mistake somewhere. We're well beyond what you're, you can expect to see on the GMAT. Again, 2% of your questions are going to be combinations, permutations. Are you likely to see something that's quite this funky? Not that likely. Is it possible? Sure. This is, this is similar to a handful of questions that are out there, but very broadly similar. The exact wrinkles in it aren't the same ones you're going to see next time. The kind of thinking you need for really, really hard ones, sure, absolutely embedded in here. But don't memorize the steps on this particular one. That's not going to help you. It's just the thought process we're trying to build over time if you're trying to get these super tough ones right. Okay. Four-digit positive integers greater than 4,000. And we want to know how many of them have three digits equal to each other and then a fourth digit that's different. For me personally, and again, tons of different ways to solve this. And if you did something different than what I'm going to do and you arrived at the same answer, fantastic. I'm going to do the thing that I think is the most intuitive that we find to be the most intuitive kind of ways of thinking for our students. I'm going to start with kind of an example here just so, so I can illustrate the principle to myself and see if I can expand it out. Now, that first digit is where I'm going to begin. I know it's got to be a four or above. I'm going to pick something kind of in the middle just to, just to kind of help me think through. I'm going to, let's pretend the first one is a seven. And I want to start thinking through ways that it's possible to get three digits that are the same and a fourth digit that's different. Well, thought number one uh, is that, well, these all could be not seven, but matching. Now, how many ways are there for that to happen? There's 10 digits, zero through nine. These aren't seven. So there's nine different ways for me to create a number that starts with a seven. And then the rest of it is non-seven. So here we've got nine ways. And again, that's just with the seven at the beginning. This doesn't need to be a seven. We'll relax this little assumption in a second. Now, the second thing I start thinking about here is, well, what if we start with that same seven, but now we end up with three sevens and one of something else? So let's suppose that this last digit is the not seven, and these are the sevens. Well, there's nine different things that could be here, right? Can't be a seven, could be anything else, zero through nine. And now here's one thing that's really easy to forget here is that now this doesn't have to be in the last spot. The non-seven could be here, here, or here. So there's nine ways if the non-seven is here, but then we multiply that by three to reflect the fact that if we're starting with a seven, if this is our fixed quantity here, then I've got nine times three different ways to have a number that's three sevens in the digits and something else in the fourth. So times three, that gives me 27. All right, great. So now I'm getting somewhere because I've got 36 different ways total in this situation. And now all I have to do with one little wrinkle that I'll get to at the end. So step number three for me is to say, well, if this is true for seven, it's going to be the same thing for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we've got six different starting numbers and all the rest of this is the same. I've got 36 ways for a seven. At the beginning of sevens at the beginning, 36 different numbers I can construct with three of a kind and one that's different. So I can go great 36 times six. So four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, six different starting numbers, 36 different variants from there. And that gives me 216. Hold on here. Very typical. It's not the GMAT's trying to get you, it's just the kind of ways that the language ends up manifesting itself. They can give you just a tiny, tiny bit of trouble if you're not paying attention greater than 4,000. So 4,000 is one of these 216 numbers, but it isn't one of the ones I'm counting here because I want four digit positive integers that are greater than 4,000. So 4,000 is not in there. I've got to subtract out that one. And that gives me 215. And my answer is B. Hope you enjoyed that one. Last question. I think this is the toughest of the group. If you disagree, fantastic.
All right. If you're not squirming, congratulations. If you're still squirming or you want to grab with us some more, feel free to hit the pause button as always. And I know I'm broken record in this video, but this is well beyond what you're likely to see. Is it derived from things that are things you can sometimes say that you met? Absolutely. The concepts here are legit. They appear, they appear fairly and frequently in this particular combination. I can't think of an example of it. Uh, kind of just having fun with you guys and coming up with the most complicated, nasty combinatorics question we can think of that's still within the bounds of the GMAT. Could you see something this difficult? Yeah, I suppose you could. But if you're seeing things that are that hard in an adaptive test like the GMAT, good for you. You're doing great. Don't let this destroy your, your psychology. If you look at this, you read it once, you read it twice, you read it three times, you have no idea what to do. Guess and move on. Even if you're going for that 50 or 51, don't let this ruin your day if you do see something that's this tough. Okay, so mostly just having fun with you guys here. We've got seven people sitting around a round table. Three people like to slap each other, four people don't. And we want to know how many different seating arrangements are possible in which those three slap slappers are separated from one another. Um, all right, my first thought here is if I were the one creating this seating arrangement, and again, plenty of different ways to do this, I like to start with that intuition. I'm picturing myself in this situation. I'm the guy that's organizing the seats at these round tables at the Oscars. I'm going to start by saying, okay, I've got some, some non-slappers. Let me, let me see those guys first because they're reasonable humans. How many ways could I arrange those four slappers or non-slappers? Well, the temptation here is to say, well, let's imagine that there's four slots and there's four for the first slot. Again, just focus on the non-slappers for a second and three and two and one. A lot of what we deal with as we get into combinations and permutations, the harder ones, is how much redundancy is happening. Are we overcounting something in some way? That was the whole deal with the, the Mississippi rules, people like to call it, when you have a repeated letter in those two questions we did. Same sort of idea here, except different logic behind it. Because we're arranging them in a circle, are we overcounting in some way? So take a look at these four arrangements of four different colors. I've got blue, green, purple, orange, orange, blue, green, purple. If these were in a line, these would look like four distinct ways to arrange these four colors, right? They would be four distinct ways. But notice what I've done here. They're always in the same sequence if you stick them in a circle. Blue, green, purple, orange. Blue, green, purple, orange. Okay, I'm starting somewhere different, but it's still blue, green, purple, circling back around orange. Blue, green, purple, orange. Blue, green, purple, orange. So what happens here? A little bit of a slippery concept. But when you've got things in a circle... We're over counting by a factor of however many items you have arranged in that circle. So instead of four factorial ways to arrange the four non-slappers, it's four factorial divided by four. So I get three factorial, three times two. So there's really just six different ways to arrange these guys. It doesn't seem right, but that's actually correct here. Sometimes people refer to this as the uh, circle permutation formula, which seems like an unnecessary thing to create and memorize a new formula for, but that's the logic underneath that you don't really need the formula. If you've already memorized it for some reason, you understand it well, great. If not, don't worry about it. Just think through that logic of how much overcounting am I doing. I'm overcounting by a factor of however many things I'm arranging in that circle. Odds of appearing on the GMAT, I've maybe seen it in two or three official questions out of the thousands that have ever been in print. So don't lose too much sleep over it. Okay, so as a starting point here, I've got six different ways to arrange those non-slappers. And I'm going to erase and rewrite just that six because I'm going to need the space. So step one, I've got six ways to arrange the non-slappers. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Okay. Now I've got to think about those three slappers. Where are they going to go? They're going to go somewhere between these guys. And of course, there are fewer slappers than there are non-slappers. So it gets a little bit funky. And the first thing I need to think about, again, this, this is what I find the most intuitive on this problem. First thing I'm going to do is say, well, which spots do they go in? Between which pairs of non-slappers do we stick the slappers? So again, just imagine these people around a round table. Nothing special about the colors there or anything. So we've got four different spots that we could fill. And what we're going to do is we're going to fill three of the four spots. How many ways are there to do that? Well, this is, we're going to choose three spots to fill out of four. As soon as I say the word choose, it should sound like combinations to you, not permutations. So we're going to choose three of four to fill. Four factorial over three factorial, one factorial. So that's just four different ways to do that. So again, I'm going to rewrite this up here. So part two. I've got four 
combos of three seats that can be filled. Having fun yet? All right. Last little thing. Now, whoever I've got in this picture here, and I'll redraw it quickly here as an actual circle. And I've got my non-slappers with little N. And wherever it is, I have my slappers. Let's say that they're here, here, and here. Well, now I've got to worry about how to rearrange those three individuals. So how many ways are there to rearrange three individuals in three different seats? That part's pretty easy. So just three factorial. Doesn't matter that they're in a circle anymore because these are three distinct spots. So part three, I get three factorial ways to arrange the slappers. Okay, now we're pretty much there. I've got three different numbers here, six ways to arrange the non-slappers. For each of those, I have four combinations of three seats that can be filled. So six ways to rearrange, or six ways to arrange the non-slappers, four different combos of three seats that can be filled by the slappers. So times four. Now for each of these sets of, of spots that can be filled, arrangements of the non-slappers, I have six arrangements of the slappers, so times six again. And we get uh, 36 times 4, which I believe is 144. And I hope that's an answer choice. Yes, it is. All right. And our answer is B. Again, I, I know you're probably tired of hearing it if you've made it this far in the video. If you nailed this and this wasn't a struggle and you're getting kind of bored by the explanation, fantastic. You are probably overstudying combinations and permutations. If you struggled a little bit and you're kind of missing one little piece here or there, that's great. You're doing fantastic. If you're shooting for high 40s on the GMAT, you're doing great if you can come close on these guys, to be honest. I killed one of my best tutors with this question. Didn't even come close. It was, it was fun to watch, and he's frankly smarter than I am. I just had the advantage of having written it. And again, if you're watching this and your goals are fairly modest and you made it this far and you're really, really struggling on an example like this, don't worry about it at all. Very rare variants. Having a little bit of a good time with this. All right. That's it for combinations and permutations. Not a whole lot more we can throw at you on this topic at all. This pretty much covers everything. Can you see slightly different tweaks? Sure. But the processes, basic formulas, basic understanding, basic intuition, just applying it in different combinations, that's really all there is to it. Hope you enjoyed this. And thank you so much for watching.